Well, this new book was a gift to me while I was healing from my broken knee. Retired Disciples of Christ minister and member of the St. Luke's community, Reverend Bill Nottingham, is co-author with Reverend Charles Harper of this book, Escape from Portugal, The Church in Action, The Secret Flight of 60 African Students to France. It is the story of a dramatic, clandestine operation sponsored by the World Council of Churches in 1961. Soon after the first anti-colonial rebellions broke out in Portuguese Angola in 1961, the student community in Portugal suffered increasing harassment by the Portuguese political police. Passports were confiscated. Suspected student leaders were imprisoned. Many students decided to try to flee Portugal. It was risky business. False passports had to be found. Contacts set up for night border crossings into Spain. And then overland transportation to France. Some of the students appealed to the World Council of Churches in Geneva to help them escape. The challenge was accepted by the French Protestant service agency, La Chimad. Many of the students later became leaders in their home countries, changing forever the face of the African continent. Bill Nottingham and Chuck Harper found their place at the river. Bill, on the left, laughs that at 32 years of age, he was the oldest collaborator in this project. Bill, Bill and Pat, please stand and let us recognize you. Bill at 32, his co-author Chuck was 27 years old at the time of the escape. Bill was responsible for the transportation of the 60 students across the 800 miles of Spain with a border crossing then into France. And he recruited three American seminary students all in their early 20s. This is an amazing story of young grit and spiritual resistance. Imagining these young people exercising this kind of spiritual journey, this kind of resistance in an age of colonialism and oppression. So as our choir sings, let me ask you this question. What impulse what internal drive causes people to offer their time, energy, and leadership to help other people thrive? Well, the image of the river remains with me from my visit to Angola, West Africa in 1998. This refugee camp of 15,000 persons emerged only a week earlier when continuing civil war in the interior of the country drove families to the coast, just 60 kilometers north of Luanda, Angola, where we were staying, the capital of Angola. United Methodist Bishop Emilio de Cavallo accompanied us on our visit because seven United Methodist congregations and their pastors were among the displaced persons. The picture on the right is me standing with the seven pastors of the seven Methodist churches. 
When our van turned down into this dry riverbed where the thatched huts were clustered, the gathered people could see the bishop in the front seat driving. Such singing and clapping and dancing erupted that our cars were consumed in clouds of dust. Bishpo, 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 they sang. The district superintendent, pastors, and lay leaders greeted us in the United Methodist Church of the Refugee Camp, only a week old. It was in a clearing in the middle of the camp, marked by a lashed-together pulpit and an altar of brush with logs laid out in rows for pews. Every person who came to the gathering had their own copy of the United Methodist hymnal, a cherished possession that had been unpacked carefully after the 300-mile journey from their homes. We sang Leaning on the Everlasting Arms in Kimbundu. We prayed together for the Civil War to cease. And after the service, one of the pastors brought a translator over to me. He had noticed my angel pen. We were led like Moses and the Hebrew people from our homeland into the wilderness, he said. And then he told the story. An old man joined us for our walk. He was obviously a man of great wisdom, maybe a chief, but no one knew him. But, of course, many were separated from their families. It was not unusual. During our long walk to this place, no one, no one died from the landmines. Even all of the children made it safely to this place. This old man seemed to know the way, and so we trusted him. And when we got to the river, my family was going to take him into our home, into our hut to care for him, because he said that his own son had been killed in the war. But the man has disappeared. He is not in this camp. And then we remembered what God said to Moses, that my angel will go before you to show you the way. I took my pen off and left it on Pastor Grassa's lapel with a prayer that the angels would then lead them to a new home because, you see, the rainy season was coming and the river would soon rise and displace them again. 15,000. Have you found your place at the river? At St. Luke's, we talk about rivers as a way to help us serve. Often, we are drawn to acts of kindness by an immediate need, a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, a book to read, a ride to the doctor, a room for the night. We accompany these people in that crisis, listening to their story and learning about their lives. We ask questions, seeking to understand the cause. And then we might respond with scholarships or tutor reading or teach financial planning or offer employment or affordable housing. But we act to empower people to lead their own change. An outward-focused life just flows naturally from following Jesus. Not only are we sustained by God's love, but the Spirit of Jesus always motivates us to keep learning and growing, expanding. Risk-taking service pushes us out of our comfort zone and into places that we would never go on our own. Those who practice this risk-taking service place themselves in situations that often change their minds. They voluntarily set aside their own convenience for a higher purpose. They follow Jesus into areas they would not tread of their own volition. They practice service with passion and intentionality, pouring themselves out for others. 
They go where Jesus leads, even when it is uncomfortable, awkward, unexpected, and costly. They risk. They find their place at the river, even in the rapids. Psalm 46 is a song for riding the rapids. The first two words bring so much confidence. God is. God is. God is our refuge and our strength, always near in times of great trouble. Do we actually believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that God is? Can we sing of this very present help, even more present than the trouble itself? My Baptist grandmother used to always get in my face when I was afraid. Now I know she was quoting the 19th century icon, Charles Spurgeon, who would have known. But she would insist, now let me get this right, Janet, evil may ferment, wrath may boil, pride might foam, but the brave heart of holy confidence never trembles. <laughs> now that'll set a nine-year-old straight. The brave heart of holy confidence never trembles. Except my grandmother said, trembles not. <laughs> so, we sing the psalm and we come to the river, whose streams make glad the people of God. Streams that are not intermittent, but are flowing with grace. And then the invitation to stillness, even in the rapids, Remember, I am, I am. One word from God stills the storm. Only one word. Thanks be to God. You know, the true story that Bill and Chuck tell reads like a spy novel. The Guardian newspaper of March 8th of 2015 called it The Great Escape that changed Africa's future. In June of 1961, 60 Portuguese-speaking African students were helped to escape Antonio Salazar's Portugal across Spain and into France. Most were Angolan intellectuals. Others came from Mozambique, Guinea-Bissau, the Cape Verde Islands, and Sao Tome and Principe. Soon after the first armed rebellions broke out against colonial rule in Angola, the students, men, women, and children, faced increasing harassment by the notorious Portuguese police. Passports were confiscated and arrests occurred. Many of the students decided to flee Portugal illegally, and with the help of this French Protestant service agency, fresh passports, don't you like that? Fresh passports from friendly African independent countries were found. Contacts were set with smugglers for night border crossings into Francisco Franco, Spain. Overland dashes and powerful rented automobiles into France were organized. Bill and his three other American young men in Paris at the time were recruited to be drivers across Spain. Some students, graduates of North American and British missionary schools in Africa, appealed to the World Council of Churches in Geneva to help them escape. As a representative of the student Christian movement in Lisbon, Portugal, Pedro Felipe served as a crucial partner in organizing the students and serving as a go-between with this vast network of collaborators. Reverend Burl, Reverend Burl Kreps, who served as a Methodist missionary in Angola from 1955 to 1958, esteems the courage of this young man, Pedro Philippe. Burl, would you let us know? You're here with us, Reverend Burl, a missionary in Angola, 1955-1958. was a young man, then served churches throughout the Rocky Mountain Conference uh, upon coming home. But Burl uh, says that Pedro f 
fostered, and actually the book says that Petro fostered this deep and indispensable mutual respect that bridged many faith traditions and political ideologies. In an email message that Burl received just last Sunday from Pedro Philippe, Pedro indicates the broad reach of this plan, and he writes, Thanks to the strong and decisive intervention of both President John F. Kennedy of the United States and, Charles, and General Charles de Gaulle of France, both pressured Generalissimo Franco of Spain, who wanted to send us all back. To Portugal. What a broad network of collaborators. The book is a thrilling day-by-day -day narrative of the adventure, from precise urban pickups on street corners to back roads through the forests, across a raging river, avoiding detection by the Portuguese police. Close calls on terrible roads across 800 miles of northern Spain were followed by detention and prison by suspicious Spanish authorities. And it was this act of detainment that triggered this urgent international diplomatic activity. Bill, I think the most moving part for me of the book was the story of the several nights in prison and sleeping upon those moldy mattresses and not knowing where the future would take you or, at that point, your 41 charges. Very moving. Freedom, then, was all the sweeter when, at last, they were over the border into France. Vous êtes libre, vous êtes libre. You are free. You are free. Many of these African men and women later served as distinguished leaders of government and society in their countries. Presidents. Presidents of the Republic of Mozambique and the Republic of Cabo Verde, as well as prime ministers, parliamentarians, cabinet officials, ambassadors, bishops, and clergy. Amazing. Riding the rapids is an exhilarating experience. In order to survive, it takes collaboration across vast differences. Bill signed my book in ecumenical fellowship across politics and ideologies, across faith traditions and skepticism, across differences in age and race, people were rescued. The General Secretary of the World Council of Churches at, a, at that time stated, this is the church in action. Not only a fearless conversation, but a fearless initiative. Riding the rapids is an exhilarating experience. In order to survive, it takes resources. In 1961, it was, at that time, the Methodist Church, global ministries of the Methodist Church, that funded the escape from Portugal. Never let anyone tell you that writing a check doesn't make a difference. To those who much is given, much is expected. Thanks be to God. I want you to know that just last week, St. Luke's joined in this vast collaboration with restaurateurs and civic leaders and a bank to complete the raising of $45,000 for a new truck for our partner, We Don't Waste. We did it. We got him over the hill last Sunday. Riding the rapids is an exhilarating experience, and in order to survive, it takes prayer. We are busy people, almost frenetic, and I want us to remember to pray, just to be still and know in times of turbulence. I had a leadership team in a former congregation that was struggling with an issue that might have divided the congregation. The discussion was going nowhere, and tempers were flaring, and someone suggested that we simply postpone the discussion until the next meeting. And then the intervening weeks, we should pray about the issue and pray for reconciliation. And another team member pushed back his chair in disgust and said, Janet, good heavens, have we come to that? <laughs> pray. 
Prayer is not the last resort. It is the primary and radical action. Bill ends his book with this reflection. After it was all over, we all thought about this astonishing experience through which we were given the unique privilege of accompanying these courageous students out of Portugal and into an uncertain future. Maybe it was a weakness, but I relied on God desperately. This is why for me, the events that we experienced cannot be conceived except in relation to faith. Prayer gave me endurance. <laughs> Karl Barth writes, To clasp one's hands in prayer is the beginning of an uprising against the disorders of the world. So, beloved, before all else fails, before the last straw, before the other shoe falls, before the rapids overwhelm the raft, let's simply pray and by our actions change the world. Amen.